Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We have uh, been uh, talking about all sorts of things. You can find it all out in the repository and our audio vault at Baltimore Positive. All of it brought to you by our friends at State Fair, chicken and waffles, and shrimp and grits. But I did sort of uh, move to the other side of the street to El Guapo last week. Uh, he's trying to move me on the tamales, Don. But uh, I did bring home some delicious tacos, some salsa, some chips, some guacamole. I did not bring home any reposado uh, tequila. But I am going to belly up to the bar at El Guapo. Our sponsors at Fadley's are also inspiring me to eat more crab cakes in 2021. Uh, we're going to be shipping those crab cakes everywhere, hopefully getting back down once we get the shots and get all squared away with doing more of these kinds of conversations with local elected officials. Uh, Don, hard to believe it's been two years next week that we got together uh, with Dutch Rupert's Burger, and two years later, we're still getting together with elected officials and talking about all sorts of things. I know this is, uh, this is one that you set up. I'm going to let you do the honors in this case. Well, we, we love talking elections. We love talking voting rights. Uh, one of the other outstanding delegates down there in Annapolis, we've been trying to survey the field, is Delegate John Cardin, Baltimore County, 11th District. Delegate, welcome to Baltimore Positive. Thank you very much, guys. It's great to see you, and uh, I'm enjoying uh, listening to all your, your, your radio coverage. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, hey, John, before we go into voting and other issues down there, um, tell folks a little bit. We always like to have the elected officials, when they come on, describe their district. Sort of take folks who are listening out there in their car, drive them around your district, and let them know what you represent. Sure. So the 11th district of Baltimore County is basically the Northwest corridor. It goes more or less from, let's say, uh, Liberty Road or between Liberty Road and Reisterstown Road from the Beltway North all the way to uh, essentially to Carroll County. And then it goes up 83 pretty much from uh, the Beltway or from inside the Beltway uh, from the city county line all the way up through to um, to uh, Hunt Valley. Well, anybody that's listening to this program, though, this is where I usually interject and say, I've done a lot of eating in your district. You know what I mean? <laughs> I start thinking about the places. I'm thinking all the carry out I'm going to, I'm visiting you right now. Uh, that, that, that's my Baltimore positive. Uh, you, you know, I, I guess for people coming new to the party, or, I, I think of you, and, and when I Googled you up or whatever, I think of the cyberbullying thing as like sort of being, you know, how your name comes to my television set as a, as a constituent and citizen here. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind. I, um, I, was, I did pass the first uh, landmark cyberbullying legislation back in 2014. And then along with uh, former Senator Bobby Zirk, and we passed an updated uh, Grace's Law uh, uh, criminalizing cyberbullying because this is something that both is in my agenda as uh, somebody who cares about families and children and people in vulnerable positions, uh, compromised positions. But really, this is about children trying to grow up in a safe environment. And oftentimes now with social media and computers that you can basically push a button and destroy somebody's life or um, make them feel harassed or tormented, we have to be very careful. So we're just trying to make sure that, tr that, that kids primarily really understand how, how difficult um, it can be if you're getting cyberbullied. So John, I, I'm intrigued. When I was thinking about you coming on, you and I've known each other a long time. I was thinking you're one of the few elected officials that I know who was down in Annapolis, had a good career as a member of the House of Delegates, stepped away for a few years, and then went back. Uh, that's a unique perspective. I'm curious for our listeners, were you, were you a better delegate the second time having stepped away and looked at it, looking at it from 10,000 feet. Was John a, Gordon different? God, I wish I could have uh, interviews like this all the time. Thank you for that question, <laughs> um, So I came in in 2002, or was elected in 2002, came in 2003 originally, served for 12 years, uh, served as the, the chairman of the election law subcommittee for eight of those 12 years on the Ways and Means Committee. I was young, I was in my 30s, um, and really uh, had a tremendous amount of energy. I was single at the time. I met my wife towards the end of my tenure there. Um, and um, and I, I had a different kind of energy. It was an exciting, young, um, trying to change the world type energy. And then I went and ran for attorney general. Um, the, the citizens of the state of Maryland decided that, 
that I should probably go into private practice, back into private practice. I understand that. And then um, took four years off and then came back. And what I have learned is that you do have perspective. Um, there's maybe a little bit, uh, I maybe have some, some, um, some age, some years behind me, but also understanding that what we're trying to do is really improve people's lives, improve the quality of life of Marylanders and making sure that our environment lasts and um, has integrity for their children and grandchildren. And when you think about that, you think about having, how to make people, improve people's lives, oftentimes it's not about putting in a uh, hundred bills. Uh, that, that can get you some notoriety, can get you some press, but really it's about making sure that the bills that are in there are properly drafted, are amended correctly. And I spend a lot of my time now I'm on the Judiciary Committee really trying to massage and work on legislation that comes through. And, um, and I think that it's those years of experience and coming back after being back in private practice for a while, although I've never left private practice, I've been in private practice all the time, um, that has helped me uh, become more of an el elder type uh, uh, legislator now. Um, I'm, pro I'm probably on the older side of, of, of legislators, even though I, I still think of myself in, as, as 30 years old. And, yeah. and that right. doesn't even compute, Delegate. I mean, that's right. If I, I'm thinking of Delegate John Cardin is now like the elder statesman down there. John, oh, I used to talk about sports. I'm like Methuselah. I've been for like 28 years. And like over the last two years, something sort of hit me. So, uh, you know, yeah. I, I think there is some seasoning and, and the way the world has moved in the last decade, right? That, well, that I think every fair-minded citizen wants to try to do something to make it better, right? Right. And, and because, I mean, first of all, we have social media that has just has exploded over the last 10 years. But we also have just the last four years, every day feels like a, a kind of a month um, because so much happens both nationally and locally in terms of and, and getting that, all that information. And there's just so much information out there for people to try and absorb. You guys do a great job of of just kind of taking on an issue and and really working on it a little bit and giving people a time to 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 let it sink in, but there's just so much out there and 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 life moves so fast that coming back here, um, it's a different world. Um, I will say it's a different world now because you have to as soon as you do something, you either have to get it out on social media and make sure that um, that everybody knows about it, or you have to figure out how to accept that you don't get notoriety for the good work you're doing, which I, I, I think that I've kind of, I've taken a, a balanced approach in doing a little bit of both. How, how hard is it, uh, Delegate? One of the things when I talk to elected officials and we sit down and certainly pre-pandemic when we'd sit down over a cocktail and talk, there was for many of them uh, an exhaustion setting in related to social media that didn't exist before. Well, Bobby uh, Zirkin, that was the first thing he mentioned yeah, when we said. Yeah, down. Bobby talked about it. Uh, Nestor has experienced it as a public figure. You've experienced it as a public figure. How difficult is it having real communication versus disinformation in the era of social media? So uh, first of all, when I was running for, um, for attorney general, I, I got blasted on social media in, with a lot of negative campaigning and, um, and kind of uh, sort of um, uh, money, that dark money that wasn't really, we didn't really know where it was coming from. So I got to taste that firsthand, what it was like. That was at the beginning of the social media world. Now we're, we're eight years later, or seven, six years later, and now um, what you're feeling is, and, and having watched, if you haven't seen it, you should watch The Social Dilemma. It's on Netflix. Um, it's a fascinating um, uh, documentary about what, what the, the, the whole idea and rationale behind social media from the developers. And I've taken a step back. I do not spend any time on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, except when you know, I have to either review a particular item um, but I have missed weddings, anniversaries, bar mitzvahs, birthdays of friends and, and from all across the country because I don't get on as much as I used to because it's just exhausting. And if you want to do your work, you got to focus on your work. And we can't, can't do every, we can't, unfortunately, being a Renaissance man now doesn't mean that you also, you can't do that and also be 
on social media and attending to it. it just well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that film, and I know because you are busy, you have to run back to a committee hearing. So we want to jump into the voting issue in just a minute. But uh, as Nestor knows, I love movies, and it's really unusual for me, even on an average movie, to stop before it gets to the end. If I'm in, I usually can can gut it out and, and make a decision at the end. Social Dilemma, Delegate, I actually stopped about two thirds of the way through because it was just depressing me. I thought <laughs> this is just way too depressing. I get it. We're all controlled by this beast, but two thirds of the way through, I, I had had enough. So yeah. people have to make their own decision. But while we've got you, Go you are at the core of one of the most important issues Nestor and I have been focusing on for well over a year. And that's the whole idea that voting should not be hard. I've got to tell you, I think it's the, it's happening right now all over the United States of America. I don't understand why one party is determined to make, I think I understand it. I don't appreciate it. Understand is not the right word. Well, I understand it's, it's, it. It's the only strategy it's, you have when it's your right. strategy, right? Let's Go make ahead. voting harder. And you're down there, your legislation, others, you've written an op-ed about what we should be doing in Maryland. So yep. walk people through your op-ed who maybe didn't read it and give us, Nestor likes this to be a social studies class. So talk to us about voting legislation. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, so um, I chaired the election law subcommittee for eight years and part of the agenda in the speaker, former speaker Bush um, and I sat down and we, and we decided that the agenda should be, we wanna make voting easy, convenient, safe, and confidence. We want to make sure that there's confidence that people believe that, the, that, that, that their vote is actually counting. And we want there to be transparency. I you to repeat that again, Delegate, to, sure. for our people. It should be what? Easy? It should be easy, <laughs> convenient, safe, transparent. Not transparent in that everybody knows who you voted for, but transparent in that you should understand how your vote gets counted. And everybody should have confidence that the system actually works. There is no reason every single Marylander who's entitled to vote should be able to vote in a convenient, easy way. It's that simple. We should not be stopping people or making it more difficult for people to vote. Well, we, what interestingly, the, the pandemic created a situation during our, our last primary where the governor decided to send every single Marylander who was registered to vote a ballot. And they could either mail it in or they could drop it off in a drop box or they could discard it and go and, and vote in person if they wanted to. And um, it worked. 73,000 more people voted than ever before. I mean, that's a, that's a, in terms of a percentage, that's a pretty good percentage of increased number of voters. So the question is, why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we just giving everybody a ballot? one of the reasons not to do it is that we don't want to become a a 100 percent vote by mail state we don't want to do that because that's going to create inconvenience for some people who need to vote in person for whatever reason so we understand that so we don't want to reduce the number of polling places out there but if you everybody gets a ballot and then instead of having to wait in line and deal with the gauntlet i call it when you have to walk through all those electioneering people i've been doing this now for 20 plus years and I sit at polling places and I hate when other people come up to me and want to give me literature. Other people love it. Some people love it, some people hate it. If you love it, good, you can enjoy it. But if you don't want to do that and you just want to take your ballot and drop it off in the drop box or take it inside and, and give it to the election judge, why shouldn't you be able to do that? And then you, if you have the ballot at home, you can look at it, you can decide in your, in your own time, in your own privacy and not worry about people looking over your shoulder or worry about um, having to ask questions to somebody else because and 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 worrying about privacy or or confidentiality because you can do it in your own home and you can invite whomever you want to or not want to to help you with making your decision. So it doesn't make any sense. And then if you want to mail it in, sure, mail it in. I don't trust the mail the post office these days, so I wouldn't mail it in. Oh, you must have watched the uh, press conference there on Wednesday. There now. What I would do is I would just take it take it to my polling place, drop it off at an early voting site or during the election day, take a picture, shoot a picture of me doing it so I can then post it on social media. 
Um, and, then, uh, and then I wouldn't have to worry so much about all that time, the 45 minutes in, in line, um, worrying about whether they have my name correct on the voter rolls, um, all the different issues that you have to deal with at the polling place. Not to say that if you don't want to do that, if you want to do it, sure. And we should, and, and we have the budgets and we have the capacity and we have the interest to keep polling places open. And I think it's a great idea. But I think that we will make it so much more convenient and, um, and so much more um, accessible to all Marylanders if we just would mail everybody a ballot. So, so is that the basis of your legislation to mandate that we mail everyone a ballot? Every single Marylander who is registered to vote, legally registered to vote, just gets a ballot. Instead of getting uh, information about who's going to be on the ballot like they do now, they just get a ballot. And they can either use it or they can rip it up and throw it away. Now, de Delegate, there are other, I know there are other pieces of voting legislation down there being talked about. Uh, one of the things that Nestor and I have been pushing for, and we, we did a fair amount of shows with folks from the Board of Elections, both at the state and at the local level. And that is this year, uh, it took special action by the Board of Elections, by the governor, to allow folks to count ballots ahead of time. It seems to us that there ought to be, we ought to mandate by law, take that issue off the table and mandate that local boards of election start counting ballots, you pick the date, a week ahead of sure. time, two weeks ahead of time, whatever it is, that that ought to be into the state law, it ought to be codified, so we don't need a special exception moving forward. I think, I think it's a great idea. I think that there is uh, legislation to deal with that, although I'm no longer on ways and means, I'm on judiciary, but um, th that's the kind of thing where it's just, look, there's no, we all have to be patient during elections now. We're, good, we're getting it right. We're finally getting it right. We're doing better and better at counting exact numbers. You know, um, with the previous county executive race, when it was nine votes that turned into 17 votes difference. I always kid him, landslide Johnny O, right? <laughs> you need to make sure that you are pretty exact with your counting. So we want to make sure we get it right. But if we can figure out a way to facilitate the counting, that's a great idea. You know, there was one, I'll tell you one more interesting bill that we just dealt with today that's uh, it's, it's being debated. It hasn't been voted on yet. It changes the way county commissioners are elected in, um, in, not, in uh, commissioner uh, uh, districts as opposed to uh, county executive districts. Um, and right now, the way that it works for them is that you have, let's say, three or five commissioners, and they're all voted, even though they represent a district, they're voted at large in the entire county. And what it does is it, it discriminates against uh, minorities because if there's an area of the county, a district of the county that is a majority minority, they'll never get a minority representative because it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a countywide election, even though you're representing that district that is a minority district. And we have the counties that are fighting this. And those of us who believe that we should have equal representation and we should have diversity in representation, and we should make sure that all, all diverse uh, individuals and all people of all walks of life should have the ability to be represented by people that they believe uh, represent them properly, um, we should change that law. Um, so it's an, interesting, it's an interesting debate that we're having, um, and it's one that I, I think in the end, we're gonna come up with the right decision. John, before we let you run, you, I don't know that I've ever asked you this in, in, in all the years we've known one another. You have a, a famous last name. You've got a legacy. You've got an uncle, and that uncle's dad held that seat, and the uncle held the seat, and the uncle now serves uh, brilliantly uh, in the United okay. States Senate. What's, what's the legacy of the card name and any pressure that goes along with it? Oh, um, wow. Um, so originally from, uh, from Eastern Europe, from the uh, Odessa, um, Ukraine area, the Cardins, and, and also some from Lithuania, um, came over in the, came over, immigrated to the United States in the early part of the 20th century. And my grandfather, Meyer Carden, uh, was a first generation American. His parents were, were, were the ones who emigrated over. His, actually, his older brother, JL, also was born in, in Eastern Europe. And um, he had a brother, Maurice. My, uh, my grandfather served in the 30s 
my uncle Maurice served in the 40s and 50s in the, in the state legislature. My uncle Ben served in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Nobody, uh, no Cardin served in the 90s in the House Democrats. <laughs> I it was a, it was a lost, lost decade. <laughs> I served in the 2000s and the 2010s. And if I should retire, I'm trying to convince my nephew, who's a brilliant law student, recently graduated from UC Berkeley and now works for legal aid. I'm trying to get him to, to consider running. But um, I, I will say that my grandfather, who after he served, uh, went on to the Supreme Bench of Baltimore City, which became the circuit court. Um, he was really, he's been really, was really the patriarch and, and he was, he was my guiding sort of mentor in public service generally. And my uncle obviously is a, is just a brilliant, wonderful person. Um, and I think that he learned a lot from his father, from my grandfather as well. Um, yes, we, uh, it, 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 there, sometimes it's big shoes to fill and you just try and, I, I try and do my best to, 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 um, to make our little corner of the world a better place. That's my, my sort of job, uh, I don't try and fill my uncle's shoes. That would be very difficult to do. Um, I don't, would never try and fill my grandfather's shoes. You mentioned but all I, that serving. I said, we, we served your uncle coffee down at State Fair last right. time. We got, yeah. One of our, back one of back our we, you know, Before we needed shots and masks and all that stuff. John, we really appreciate the visit. I know your time's short. I, I, listen, I could do the bullying thing and, and talk at length about that, my experiences and uh, political experiences and where the future needs to be on that. But we'll save that one for the next uh, conversation. I would love to come back. Really appreciate the visit. I would love to come back. Thank you. And I'd love to talk bullying. I'd like to talk about police reform. Um, you, you name it. You name the, you name the issue. And we'll, we'll come back and talk. Just don't talk Orioles with Moeller. <laughs> I love my O's. We'll, we, we'll have you back before the end of the session. Don, we, miss you, John we miss you in, in county government, Don. Well, thank you. Thank you. He's not much. coming back. Don't worry. I've, I've already <laughs> talked about that. John, appreciate it. Thank you, John Carton, joining us here along with former Baltimore County Executive Don Moeller. All of it brought to you by our friends. Um, Don, I've been talking about this crab cake thing. Well, I put this ID on you. Uh, Damie's going to love this over at Fadley's. All of our sponsors, including Costas, everybody's going to love my crab cake ID. The Pizza John's, they have a crab cake. I talked about crab cakes with Evan. Oh, look what we got there. Oh, now you got, now you've done it because oh, look Nestor's at this. Hold a on. dog Before we guy. go, we got to get this on camera. John, who's this? This is Matilda McLovin, named after the uh, the uh, character from Superbad. Superbad, oh, I was going to say. You know, I, since I've moved in my studio, I'm starting to whisper. I think my cat might start coming onto the set. And that would make the show a lot better <laughs> if we just found out. Right? John Carden and his, uh, his beautiful pooch. Rescue Thank there, you. hopefully. Uh, Thank uh, you. Shout out to Be More Humane. There you go. I knew I was going to get some people in out on Nicodemus Road uh, and shouting them out for all the good work they do as well. We are WNST that AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking beautiful pets and Baltimore positive.